Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Live from Oakland, California. How are you doing? Colleen Patrick Goudreau here. I feel like it's been a long time since I've done a live Q&A, a live broadcast, and I just thought it was time to say hello and share some hope with you, answer any questions you might have about veganism, animal advocacy, compassion, activism, government, politics, our upcoming inauguration, for which I have a KQED perspective, an NPR editorial. It's already up on the KQED website. It airs tomorrow morning, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, so for those of you who know and who don't know, my name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. You probably know since you're already following me here on Facebook. And I'm an animal advocate, an author, an activist, an advocate, and speaker, and I do what I can to inspire people to live a compassionate and healthful life. And I'm very excited about my new podcast called Animology, and I hope you're all subscribed to it by now. You are, right? And you've written a review, and you've gone over, and you've rated it on iTunes, and you've subscribed, and you've downloaded. Just want to make sure. It's a podcast all about the animal-related words and expressions we use every day and how those words and expressions affect and reflect our relationship with animals. And it's very exciting. Thank you, Isaac. Appreciate that. Isaac, you wrote to me uh, about the Boy Scouts, didn't you? I have an answer for you, and I couldn't find where your question was, so I couldn't answer. Karen, it's brand new. It's called Animology, and it's at iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and wherever you listen to podcasts. And there are now six episodes up there. I just recorded some more today. And I have six already up there, including Inauguration and Coccyx and... Yeah, you're going to test me, and uh, Zodiac, and many more. So I just launched today the episode called ah, Eating Crows <laughs> and Eating Humble Pie, and you can find that. Uh, it's live now. Oh my gosh, Allie, how long have you been gone for? We are so excited for you. Uh, Allie just said that she's going to the Elephant Nature Park, which I know is in Thailand, and we will be going there in October on our vegan trip with CPG to Thailand, which is sold out, and um, we're very excited. So have an amazing time, and let me know about it. I really want to hear uh, what you think about it. Forrest said, listening from Western Canada, thanks for sharing the vegan consciousness. Hey, no problem. My pleasure. Forrest, welcome. Thanks for, for joining us. And Isaac, good. Isaac, send an email to support at joyfulvegan.com and I'll send you the email I have for you about your question. What snarls? John, I'm not snarling. What are you talking about? Uh, and what else? Hi, Ginny. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Normada. Welcome. And yes, thank you, Karen. You converted me to vegan a year ago and a half ago using your 30-day vegan challenge. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Lots of good news. Lots of great things happening. Uh, the 30-day vegan challenge is actually in the hands of a new publisher, and it will be getting lots of distribution and... Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Accessibility, uh, uh, exposure is the word I'm looking for, uh, that it did not get in the hands of the last publisher. So I'm very excited about that. So for those of you who have taken the 30 Day Vegan Challenge, awesome, thank you, I'm thrilled. I actually met some folks to, uh, over the weekend. I live in Oakland and there's a new vegan restaurant opening. There was, there was a new vegan restaurant. There is a new vegan restaurant that opened this weekend on Sunday. Sunday was a very exciting day. I'll tell you about it in a second. But one of the things that was exciting was this restaurant uh, called Veg Hub just opened in a neighborhood just a couple minutes from me. It's actually where I, in the neighborhood that I used to live in, where my vet still is. And uh, the city council member for that district was there for the opening of this vegan restaurant. So we went, and it was really lovely because the, um, the city council member, who I'm guessing is vegan, and if any of my friends on here can confirm that about Mary Campbell Washington. I think she's at least vegetarian. She might be vegan and she knew who I was and she was really excited to meet me, which was so sweet because I was excited to meet her and just excited to be at this restaurant. 
So we took a picture, and there was a little love fest. And then there was a couple there, and I don't know if you're here on this scope, but hello. Um, I'm calling it a periscope, a scope, but whatever, a live broadcast. Um, and they were in the middle of taking the 30 day vegan challenge and they saw me at the restaurant and they came over and said hi. And it was so adorable because the female was already vegetarian she's taking the 30 day vegan challenge. And the male of the couple has never been vegetarian. And he's that day he was vegan for 15 or 16 days, he said is so awesome because he's taking the 30 day vegan challenge so i'm just so thrilled to have that resource out there in the world and it's going to be even better with it getting major distribution so if you haven't taken the 30 day vegan challenge you can find it at 30 day vegan challenge.com you can get the book you can do the online program you can do both so i'm so thrilled i'm always happy to meet people who have taken the 30 day vegan challenge another reason it was a good day on sunday and everybody if you have any questions about veganism or animal advocacy or, or finding hope in this world, please ask your questions. I'm happy to answer them. But I'll just tell you what one of the reasons that I'm hopeful is I believe very strongly in acting locally and there's so much that needs to be done from a perspective of, of increasing compassion in this world. And of course, the way I do that in this world is through my animal advocacy and uh, some other friends and advocates in Oakland and I are starting a new group which is a political action committee, basically a PAC. It's called PAC Animal, and it is forming solely to be able to influence candidates and elect candidates who uh, have an animal-friendly stances, animal-friendly positions, so basically animal-friendly candidates, who will then enact animal-friendly legislation. That's what we're going to be there for, is to help them and guide them to um, to passing animal friendly legislation and making sure they know about anti-animal legislation and not passing anti-animal legislation. So there's so much work to be done on a local level and we're gonna be doing it and we're gonna be focusing here in Oakland but also really Alameda County. So we'll be you know, kind of paying attention to what's going on in Berkeley and, and some areas around here in Alameda. And, uh, and doing some good work. So there's lots to do, and I'm very hopeful about it. Um, there's a kitty behind me. <laughs> there is. Michiko, that's my little Michiko. Oh my God, that's so distracting. How are we going to talk with Michiko sitting right there? Michiko. <whistles> and now, I'm sure Charlie's on his way as well. Probably kick her out of that spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me know, Judy. I didn't see. Um, Robin says, no one I know has any interest in veganism. It makes me so sad and so lonely, Robin. I'm so sorry. And, you know, first of all, I would say, where do you live? Second of all, I would say, stay in touch with at least people online because I do believe having a community is so vital to being vegan, to being joyful, to staying vegan, to staying joyful, and it's so important. So please, um, please stay connected with people. There is a wonderful group that we started called the 30 Day Vegan Challenge group. It's on Facebook, and there's just the most fabulous people in that room. If anybody in that room is here, say hello to, let me see your name again, Robin. And Robin, go join that group. Um, she is precious. It's kind of ridiculous. She is the cutest cat in the whole freaking world. Michiko, what are you doing? You're not supposed to eat flowers, Michiko. You're not supposed to eat flowers, Michiko. You're not supposed to. Michiko. Michi, oh, I thought I could zoom and go up, but I can't. I can only zoom, which only you do, which means you just get my eyeball. <laughs> I was hoping to zoom more. Oh, she's leaving anyway. Michiko, why are you doing over there now? Okay, she's gonna be there. Um, a Beck is in that group, and it is just the most fabulous group, full of supportive people. And you never know, there'll be someone who might be in your in your neighborhood, in your area, in your state, in your city. You never know. Um, so, so let us know where you're from, uh, Robin. Beck says that it's fabulous. Congrats. Yeah, well, everybody can do it, right? We, we're all doing what we, uh, what we can do. So that's what I, you know, acting makes me feel hopeful. Doing something makes me feel hopeful. There's no point in just saying that things are going to be okay and things are going to be great and 
talking but but not doing anything. So what makes me feel hopeful hopeful is actually doing something and writing the story and writing the outcome. So there's no reason to feel hopeless because we can write the future. So if we can write the future, then we can create that future, then what's there to be hopeless about? Um, Christina said, I wish more doctors would recommend a vegan diet for patients. True that. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Um, you know, we can work with organizations that work with doctors to increase the awareness and increase the education um, for the public, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of public um, awareness and education and outreach. So if that's one of the areas that you feel really strongly about, then I would recommend that's something you focus on. And we're going to be the best at what we do when we're passionate about the thing we're focusing on. And so perhaps that's an area that you want to look into. Talking to your doctor, making sure literature can get into doctor's offices, arranging some kind of cooking class with doctors in the area, arranging for other doctors who are vegan, Pro providing literature from organizations like PCRM to doctors. So there's a lot that can be done. There's a lot that can be done. Uh, Beck said, I would be interested in doing that here in Chicago. So Beck, yeah, you know, starting a PAC is just basically, it basically means that you're raising funds to be able to support candidates who have animal friendly stances on on things and to make them accountable for that and then to help them enact and create legislation that will protect animals. So if there are or people in your area who want to form that organization, then, you know, then go for it. I think it's a really effective, powerful way to um to act because I really do believe that laws protect animals. You know, this news that we have about Ringling Brothers closing, it's fabulous news. It's a reflection of the paradigm shift that's taking place in our society where people are aware of the plights of animals and the violence against animals and that there is a public distaste for entertainment that harms animals. That's really hopeful. And that Ringling Brothers Closed is really hopeful. And we still need to make sure that we get on the books that performances with any kinds of animals uh, are illegal. So right now in this particular climate, in this particular administration, do I feel hopeful that we're going to have federal legislation pass? No, I don't feel that hopeful. I'm <laughs> not saying that I'm not hopeful in general, but I don't really think that's really where a lot of energy uh, is best spent. But statewide, do I think that we could have a lot of luck, especially now with the momentum of Ringling Brothers closing in terms of getting states to pass laws that make it illegal for any traveling act? Because, you know, there could be another company that, that fills the void with Ringling Brothers closing. It's unlikely because of Ringling Brothers can't do it. And what is a Feld of Feld Entertainment is worth like two, I could be wrong, it might not be 2.5 billion, it might be 2.9 billion dollars. That's what he's worth. The money that he has made on the backs of animals, uh, he's worth two point something billion dollars. Does the point something really matter at that point? <laughs> at that point, it's just, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so that if they can't do it, it's unlikely that another company is going to be able to do it. But there are still going to be there are still smaller shows out there, and probably worse in terms of the conditions for animals. So we need to close that all of that all of those loopholes and get it uh, to to um, to be illegal to have animal acts. Whole countries are passing laws that make it illegal to have wild animal acts. Mexico and Peru and the Netherlands and Israel and countries all around the world are, are making animal acts illegal. And that's what we need to do. So if we can't do it on a federal level right now, then we could at least do it on a state level. Start it on a city level. Start it on a city level. So we're going to be doing that in, with our pack, with our pack called Pack Animal. And uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Zoos need to go next. Rodeos absolutely, absolutely need to go. Uh, so let me see about some questions you have here. I've just been babbling. 
Um, Karen says, now I'm vegan. I can't really understand how people ever thought it was okay to eat animals in the first place. It's pretty evil. Well, Karen, I would advise you to remember and to understand how people can eat animals. Because if we forget what it was like to be compelled to consume animals without thinking about it, then we're not going to be very good spokespeople for living compassionately and for veganism. And I don't say that to chastise you. I say that because I know what you mean when you say that and it's probably just an expression you're using. But we absolutely have to remember what it was like to eat animals and to understand why people do it. Because in understanding why people do it and understanding all of the, the psychological and social factors that go into enabling us to love one animal, I'm pointing over here, I'm pointing over here as if Michiko is still there, but she's gone. Oh, she's hiding behind the plant, the plate. Uh, she's over there hiding behind the plate. Michiko! Michiko! Leave whatever you see there. Get over here. She sees something on that plant. I don't want her to climb that plant. Um, in understanding the factors that contribute to us consuming animals, we will be better advocates for veganism. So that's all I, that's all I want to say. So I'm not chastising you, but I know what you mean. Uh, Aaron says, I live in a very non-vegan area too. Robin, so I feel for you. I'm part of a lot of amazing online groups and make friends. Sometimes you can travel once in a while to a veg fest. It will show that you are not alone. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Do what you can to not feel alone. It's so important. And then we've got a little love fest going on. Wish my family got it, but they don't. I get it. I understand, Karen. Uh, Keegan says, super off topic, would you ever consider doing a tour or something in Canada in the future? I would love to see you speak live sometime. Food for Thought changed my life. Aw, thank you for being you, huge fan. Thank you, Keegan. That is so sweet. Um, I am always interested in doing tours and doing things and doing speaking engagements. It's just hard because there's just not a lot of funds for it right now. And when, in, when organizations invite me to come speak, I'm always so thrilled, but not all of them have funds to be able to to host me, some do. Where are you in Canada? I've spoken in Toronto before. I know that there's talk of some people bringing me up to Vancouver, but I don't know what part of Canada you're in. You might be in the middle of the country, which would be a little harder. Um, and you know, I've been doing more of my own events. I had the event last year in Oakland that was a big success. We had um, about 75 people come to the Compassion Immersion Retreat. And this year, I might be doing it in London. So if you're in London and you're interested, let me know. But we're looking at venues right now. It has to be, this has to be easy for me to be able to do this so far away. But um, we are looking. And so there's a possibility that something like that might happen in Canada. And then, of course, I'm doing these trips. And we're starting to look at doing more of these kinds of trips um, that makes it more fun. So our trip to Thailand is in October. And that's going to be a week spent with me and doing workshops and Q&As and cooking demos and just having fun. Um, of course, that's also the point. Uh, that's in October. And next year, we might do Vietnam. If we don't do Vietnam, we might do Thailand again. But we might, we might do Vietnam. So we're looking into all different ways to enable me to connect with people in person in a way that is also um, really value added for, for everybody. But thank you, Kiki, and I really appreciate that. Kit says, I'm fortunate to work at the Cleveland Clinic, Doc Dr. Esselstyn of the Forks Over Knives program. Yep, works there in the wellness program. So many doctors there are very supportive of a plant-based diet. I'm sure, Kit. Well, that's fantastic. Lucky you. Lucky you. Not everybody's good. It's pretty so lucky. <sighs> Seriously? Ah, oh, God, I just want to eat her up. Beck says, me too, Keegan. That podcast was it for me. I'm so thrilled. I love it. Um, there are workers from the Ringling Company that claim they grew up in the business and never saw anything but the best of care and bonds to their animals. How do I show them that the whole concept is still wild animal exploitation? Is it even my place to? Yeah. So, Marlene, that's a good question. I mean, I always say when we ask about, you know, what to say when someone says X, my first question is, are they asking you your opinion? In the sense that, are they open to a dialogue? Are they actually interested in having a conversation with you? Because sometimes I think um, we assume that they do and then we feel really frustrated that people don't hear what we have to say. <laughs> so the best way for people to hear what we have to say is to have a dialogue and have a conversation and to already have an openness. Uh, and an opening in that in that dialogue. So I would say, you know, if people are open to having that conversation, if you're talking about with the workers who were already there, you might not 
have a lot of success in changing their minds if their experience was based on their perception and their sensory perception then you might not have a lot of luck um but if they're open to having a conversation with you then of course as for telling others and for ed, you know educating other people of course that's uh that's something you can do so i don't know if i'm answering your question but um you know we all live in a bubble and we all look through the lens of what's familiar to us and i don't doubt that the people who worked at ringling or work at ringling uh see look through the lens of 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 well first of all i do believe that, that a lot of them are connected to the animals a lot of people want to be in that work because they love being around animals i think that's the irony of it and yet if you're looking through that lens where you where where you where you have to believe that the animals are well taken care of then that's what you're going to see <laughs> you know that's what you're going to see and especially if that's where your bread and butter come from then that's what you're going to believe so i believe that they believe that and i think that's a really important first place to start because if we start with no you're that's not true then we're basically denying someone else's reality and they're not going to be really open to hearing what our perception is does that make sense hold on i have to look at michiko again i have to look at her. what are you doing this is what I have to live with every day with this cuteness. It's ridiculous. I can't t stand it. Oh, Valerie says, do you know, of any, know anything about their sanctuary or center for elephant conservation that the elephants are going to? Yeah, Valerie, you can look at some articles that came out after Ringling decided to stop having elephant acts in their shows. And there was a whole, huge article. I, I, I'd have to find it if you're really interested. Let me know and I'll put it in the Facebook page here on the comments. But there was an article about the elephant conservation. It was called the Elephant Conservation Center, which is where the elephants were going to. And they were still using bull hooks there. So I am not, I don't know. I don't know where all of these animals are going to go. I'm just, I'm hoping that they're willing to work with animal sanctuaries, proper sanctuaries. Because, of course, if you juxtapose this conservation center that Feld was funding with something like the um, like paws here in California where there is a huge area for elephants to be able to roam to be completely on their own to be in as close to nature as well, as close to the wild as possible they are in nature uh, it was a it was a striking difference so see if you can find something about that but I'm really hoping that Feld's gonna work with animal sanctuaries you know an, they, they don't want to give credit to animal rights activists and they don't have to I don't think we need the credit but I think it's really unrealistic um, to not acknowledge and I think I think they've acknowledged it that they don't want to keep fighting at City Hall. This is another reason we're starting this animal pack is because they have had lawsuits from animal groups and, and the animal groups have lost. And the animal groups have lost a lot of money in trying to sue Ringling Brothers for different, um, different acts of cruelty. That, I don't believe, was what closed Ringling. I think... The, they saw the writing on the wall in a couple areas. I think, number one, they saw that they were going to be fighting city by city by city by city. Because I don't know if you know the story, but when L.A. put forth the ban at City Hall in Los Angeles to ban the bull hook, that was really one of the best, that was the most brilliant tactic to shut down the circus. Because, of course, that is such a huge part of what they do and, and part of the training that they use for elephants that cost effectively, you know, cost effectively and, and being, and like, since that was a huge part of how they train the elephants, they couldn't go into like this major city where it was one of their main uh, audiences. So then Oakland activists, and I was a small part of it, not in any significant way, but Oakland activists then took up the bill with their city council members, and it passed in Oakland. And Feld, Ringling, saw the writing on the wall, that they were going to have to do this city by city, because then a lot of cities were contacting us in L.A., and how did you do this, and now we want to do it in our city. And then it was good. then they decided to not have an elephant acts. And of course, the next thing we were going to do was, okay, not having any wild animals at all in circuses. So they just saw this was going to be something they were going to be fighting at City Hall um, 
one city after another, and that gets really expensive, especially, you know, your $2.9 billion pockets would start dwindling. And that's what they saw. I don't doubt they probably also saw the writing on the wall with what happened with SeaWorld, with, you know, Blackfish being a film that has become the symbol for, um, for animal suffering uh, in, in aquatic parks. And so I, I do believe that's what they saw, and I do believe the public. And they all, I also saw a quote from Feld who said something akin to, because they believe that the circus is a great thing. They believe that. They said that, like, you know, this is a great thing. They want people to come and enjoy the circus. They didn't want their mothers and children being screamed at by activists every time they attended. So every person who showed up at a protest, every person who wrote a letter to the editor, every person who wrote a letter and showed up at City Hall to ban the bull hook and who was putting forth legislation to ban at wild animal acts and to ban elephants and circuses, every single one of those things made a difference. So they can say that they didn't do this because of animal activists, and they can say that. But we all know that all of that contributed to a paradigm shift that's happening in society right now, which is a public taste for entertainment that doesn't involve the exploitation and abuse and violence against animals. All you have to do is look at any of these photographs of elephants having to stand on their heads to know that this is not natural. I just came home from Botswana. I saw elephants walking through the wild. None of them were standing on their heads. None of them were standing, you know, next to each other, on each other's backs and leaning. Like, n no lion I saw in Botswana was jumping through a fiery hoop. None of them would do that on their own recourse. Like, none of them would do that. So, so you just have to look at these pictures to know how unnatural this was and, and to know how much abuse has to take place to persuade animals to do that. Pain has to be inflicted on these animals to persuade them to jump through a fiery hoop. Have you, have you seen a cat, like, hear a loud noise? <laughs> like, they want to avoid anything that could potentially harm them like all animals do. So... So they saw the writing on the wall, and now we need to just keep pressing in City Hall around the world, around the country, and and make it illegal for any kind of animal act. That's what we need to do as far as the momentum. So write to local groups, write to some, some national groups, and find out if they're doing anything in terms of legislation uh, in your city or in your state that you can be part of, because the momentum is here now to build on um, to make it so that animal circuses are a thing of the past and then we never see them again. That's what we, that's what we want. That's what a compassionate society uh, looks like. All right, sorry, I went on and on about that. Act locally, think globally, indeed. Uh, I've been invited to a family party. The menu is whole roasted pig. Do you think I should go? It breaks my heart. Christine, that's a, that's a decision you're going to have to make for yourself. I know that, I know that for me... I've gone back and forth around parties that revolve around animal parts being burned. Basically, that's what they're, it's like basically animal flesh being like, you know, getting third degree burns. That's basically what barbecues are, right? And there was a time where I said no to every barbecue that, that I was ever invited to. And then I started saying yes. And I really liked being the vegan in the room. And I really know that my being there was impactful and inspiring for people. And for me, you know, I stayed clear of the barbecue pit and et cetera, et cetera. And of course brought our own food and what have you. I don't have a clear, like, you know, black and white stance on that, but I do know that there are things like a whole roasted pig. I probably wouldn't be able to handle that to be really frank. And I know that there are situations where I've written to people and said, I know you're having, maybe they're neighbors. I know you're having this event. I'm, I'm really interested in seeing you because I, I adore you. And I don't really want to be at a celebration where an entire pig is being roasted on a spit. So I'm going to bow out of this one, but can we have lunch the next day? You know, so that you're still engaging so that the people that you're, that you're not going to see that day don't feel that you're judging them. And you might be. I'm just saying, um, uh, um, so that you still have a relationship with the people who you would be seeing at that event, uh, but protecting yourself at the same time and not going to something that feels like a real offense and that is, you know, obviously a celebration of violence against animals. 
that's how that's how I would handle it. And sometimes it really depends on your mood. Sometimes you might want to go there and feel like the really strong activist to be there in the face of that violence and to be the vegan in the room and show up in that full compassion. Sometimes you might be not be in the position to do that. So sometimes I think it really depends on how you feel because I think a lot of good can come from having someone in that room who stands on behalf of compassion even if you don't say anything at all. Winnipeg, Manitoba. Where the heck is Winnipeg, Manitoba? I really am terrible with my provinces in Canada. Keegan, where is Manitoba? I'm te I'm a horrible person. It's either West Coast or East Coast, right? Because there's not a... Okay, just tell me where it is. I'm not going to say anything else. Isadora says, Sunday was my dad's birthday and I've been vegan for two years as well as my three-year-old daughter and they gave her chicken. I've talked to my family before, but they don't seem to get it. Any suggestions? Talk to them again. Talk to them again. They need to really hear, they need to really understand what that means for you and for your family and, and why. And sit them down and, 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 and really express to them with your heart, speak to their heart about why this is something you feel really strongly about. And say that you, you know, when she gets to be of an age where she can make her choice, that's something very different than, than someone putting a piece of chicken in her mouth now when she doesn't have a choice. She doesn't have a choice at three years old and she shouldn't. That's called parenting. She shouldn't have a choice at three years old. You're helping shape who she is and they are as well. And so I would just really talk to them again. Speak from your heart and tell them what it means to you and keep me posted. Kitty alert, kitty alert, it's true, she's, go she's off, she's gone, she's gone. Thanks, MJ. I'm, I'm like way, this is stuff from like a long time ago. Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee is a great place indeed. Got some people saying hello and love fest. Attendance was down for sure, paradigm shift. Social media has raised awareness, absolutely. Things are shifting, no doubt, Maynard. A wee bit off topic, but along the lines of travel, how are you and David coming along and staying overnight in all of the counties in California? Any recommendations of the most vegan-friendly areas? Oh, gosh. You know, we don't really... We... We... Oh, gosh. I'm trying to think. We always have really wonderful dinners wherever we go. We have already started making plans for Valentine's Day weekend, or the weekend before Valentine's Day, for another county. And I think we're going to do Lodi County. Uh, wait. Are we doing Lodi? I think, yeah, I think we're doing Lodi, which includes Paso Robles, um, or Paso Robles, they say. It's not Paso Robles. That's just not, that's not the way the Spanish would be pronounced. That really bothers me. <laughs> um, Paso Robles is how I would say it. Um, and so, yeah, we have been so surprised traveling and going to restaurants and finding fantastic vegan fare wherever we go. So one of the biggest surprises was in, was it Amador County in a little tiny town? It's called Pioneer, what the heck was the name of the town? This, this fancy schmancy foodie restaurant in this little tiny town had a vegan menu. So you'd just be surprised wherever you go. You'd just be surprised. Now, we're in the Bay Area, so the Bay Area is the most vegan-friendly, obviously, and when we go down to L.A. and that area. But you would just be surprised. Everywhere we go, we find really fantastic food. And I just love that moment of being in a restaurant, saying to the server and saying to the owner, we're vegan, impress us. And I love to see them kind of figure it out, and they always do. We saw that throughout Africa, in every country we were in in Africa, we see that throughout the United States. We see that wherever we go. It is so rare that we find someone who says, you know, who, who's snotty about it. And if they were snotty about it, I'd turn around and walk out that door. Um, okay, more love. Hi, Riza. Hello. Everybody's having a love fest. Hey, Karen. Karen, I'm thinking of doing an event in London. Let me know if you want to, let me know if you think it's a good idea. Um, Maynard says, you can expose people to vegan uh, food by being the vegan at a barbecue. It's true. It is true that is one option. Marlene says, thank you for your thorough analysis of the circus industry. It helps to remind me to remain compassionate for those who I disagree with. Yeah, I mean, we can hold both. We can hold both just outrage and disgust for an industry that, that exploits and hurts animals in the most humiliating, harmful, violent ways. 
And we can remember that people who are part of that are desensitized just like we were desensitized when we were contributing to violence by eating animals. So holding both of these things is something we can do. And it might be the challenge, it might be the challenge that is our real you know, personal endeavor to hold both of those spaces. But we can do both. Being outraged doesn't mean we are disrespectful and violent and, and lack compassion. And being compassionate doesn't mean that we don't care <laughs> about these issues. And so for me, I think I've done a pretty good job of holding both of those things and, and acting from that place. And that can be really difficult, but it's called living. It's called it's called being a practicing human, is what I like to call it. And uh, we can choose not to be a practicing human. We could just kind of be who we are and be angry and be cynical or roll over and not do anything and be naive. And we have choices. But I choose to be a practicing human and use all of these opportunities to be a better person, to be a stronger person, to be a more compassionate person, and to be a better advocate, and to be a voice, and to be effective. Gosh, I have such a long answers about everything. Keegan says, oh gosh, Xmas, Christmas was an experience. Everyone kept apologizing for eating ham and turkey in front of me, but it's like, don't apologize to me, you're not eating me. <laughs> it's totally true, I know, I lo love saying that. Don't apologize to me, I love that. You're not eating me, apologize to them. And that's a really good opportunity, right? To say like, well, tell me what you're, what are you apologizing for? What are you aware of that you're saying sorry for? Because I, because I'm more, I'm more hurt and sad than uh, offended. If anybody should be offended, it's for, first of all, frankly, your own sensibilities, clearly they are, and the animals. So, you know, so it's a really good opportunity to just kind of delve a little deeper and pry and say, well, tell me more about that. Like, why are you apologizing? Because there's something going on there. I think it's really interesting. Kay says, how much time do you spend the day, night before, uh, to prep for next day meals? Do you ever go a day without cooking? Um, yeah, I, I don't spend that much time prepping. I think the, I would say the, the most amount of time I spend prepping for meals start, is in my head. Like the most amount of time and energy is actually thinking. So I, so for instance, yesterday morning, I've said a number of times, and I'm not bragging, I'm really not bragging, but I don't buy milk anymore. I make all my own milk. And so, so I don't have milk in the house. If you do, it's fine. This is just what I'm doing these days and it feels good for me. I also stupidly ate all my raw almonds <laughs> because I love nuts and I ate all my raw almonds so I couldn't make almond milk, but I did have cashews. I had raw cashews. So yesterday morning I thought, okay, I want to make polenta for dinner tonight. I thought this yesterday. And so I was like, okay, in order to make polenta, I need milk. In order to make have milk, I need to start soaking my nuts. That's when I realized I was out of almonds. Now, a lot of people say that they don't soak their cashews before making cashew milk. I don't care. I do. I like soaking them. They make it. They become softer. They just. I like them. And I, a lot of people don't strain their cashews after. I do because I like it smooth. Okay, fine. Point is that's that was instrumental in me having polenta last night. I didn't do a lot of prep other than soaking the almonds and then I made the milk or soaking the cashews and then I made the milk right before I was making dinner. And then for that dinner, really, uh, the kale was already chopped up and, the, and I just had to chop an onion. So I made the kale and the onion with it. So it's an example of it doesn't really have to necessarily take energy in terms of time and activity. It could be energy just in terms of thinking about what you need to do. So that, for me, is the first thing. Um, but yeah, I do think it's really helpful. One of the things that I always say, and I didn't do this last night, but I should have. When you chop one onion for a recipe, or if an, a recipe calls for one onion, chop two onions. You've already got your cutting board out. You've already got your knife dirty. So just do two and put the second one in the container and put it in the refrigerator. So always thinking ahead. But again, you can see that's thinking. It's thinking. It's always planning ahead. And then it doesn't take much longer to just uh, to do that. So um but uh, but always making more than you need. So I'll do that when I make uh, when I make things. So the polenta that I make, I actually had it left over, so I had it for breakfast today. So I didn't 
prepare anything. Um, today is Tuesday. My husband uh, goes and practices with his band on Tuesdays. And so Tuesday nights, I'm usually on my own and I just have drinks with a friend at night. So I usually have a pretty light dinner on my own. So I didn't, um, uh, well, yeah, I, 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 I had pot stickers for lunch today and I'll probably have some edamame and actually have some tofu. I'll probably saute up some tofu. So something really simple. So no, I don't cook every day, but I do think every day about what I'm going to have. So it's not just this flailing about, but I also like the challenge. I'm also someone who likes the challenge of, okay, we have like, it seems like we have nothing in the house, but we probably do. So what can I make? When we came home from our trip to Africa and I hadn't been to the grocery store and the cupboards were bare, we had just a couple potatoes that were in the refrigerator from the whole time we were gone, which was three weeks. And I had one onion and what did I have? There was something else. So I made, I made caramelized onion mashed potatoes and God, there was something else I had something really like really pulling it out of the, pulling it out of my elbow. <laughs> so, but we had a dinner that night and it was awesome. We didn't, you know, get a pizza or anything like that. So thinking in advance, I think is the most important thing. Sorry. Another long answer. God, it's so long. Yes, Isadora, please do keep me posted. Winnipeg is the capital of Manitoba, central Canada, basically above North Dakota. Minneapolis is a popular U.S. destination for Winnipeggers just for location relativity. Thank you. I need that. Okay. Manitoba, Minnesota. That's how I'm going to remember that. Thank you. And I didn't mean to imply that there's nothing in the middle of the country. <laughs> it's kind of like the U.S., but even more so. But um, I didn't mean to imply that. I didn't mean to imply that only the the uh, West Coast and East Coast are um, where it's at. I didn't mean that. If I said that, I didn't mean that. Um, uh, Normata says, I finally found a vegan yogurt I love. Kite Hill Almond Yogurt. It's a little more expensive, but worth the price. I have not had it. I have not had it, I don't think. But it's good. You like it? I'll have to try it. I do like yogurt. I didn't like yogurt until I became vegan. I didn't eat yogurt when I wasn't vegan. I only kind of fell in love with it. First through soy yogurt, and then I kind of fell in love with coconut milk yogurt, but I like almond milk as well. Um, Ryza says, I feel uneasy about promoting accidentally vegan products that contain palm oil, but I also want veganism to be as inclusive as possible. Should I close one eye for non-vegan newbie vegans when sharing such products? Can you be more specific, Ryza? Like, what are you talking about? Tell me what you're talking about. I want to hear what you're, I want to hear something sp more specific so I can answer you. Valerie says they could at least keep some Gardein fishless fillets in the freezer at the restaurant. What restaurant? You mean just like any restaurant? Yeah, for sure. And actually, you know, one of the things that happened, this was so, this was so cool. Okay. Did you hear this story? Listen to this story. I will, I will make it short. I promise. So when we were in, uh, we left Botswana and we were going to Zimbabwe for two days just because we were going to Victoria Falls because we were heading to South Africa and we needed to kind of step over. Um, I don't support Zimbabwe in any, in any way, shape or form, but Victoria Falls, we went, it was okay. I have to say Victoria Falls, I could have skipped. Anyway, we were looking on Happy Cow for vegan, right? Food because we needed... We needed lunch and dinner. Now, we were staying at a resort in uh, Victoria Falls that uh, had a restaurant, and the breakfast was included. And um, we ate at the restaurant one night, but we still had a couple lunches we had to do and another dinner. So we, you know, we just looked online at a couple local restaurants. And then when we were walking to Victoria Falls, we stopped and looked at the menu outside of a couple restaurants. And we looked at this one restaurant that was part of this bigger hotel, really kind of fancy schmancy, looked really nice. And the location was really pretty. The setting was really lovely. And we walked in and Bridie, who my friend who we were traveling with, walked up to the maitre d' and said, hey, we're, you know, we're vegan. We'd like to come here for lunch. What, what can you guys do for us? And he said, well, let me get the chef for you. A lot of I noticed that that happened a lot in Africa. They said, let me get the chef. So the chef comes out, as does the manager of the restaurant. And the manager of the restaurant, I, I, I didn't come over until about now, and the manager's talking, and he said, oh, sure, we have this and that, and we can, we can make this and that for you. And the chef said, well, we, can, we also have, like, vegan chicken and vegan cutlets and, um, and, and such. And we said, what? And he said, 
Yeah, and the manager, and, and, and Bridie said, uh, we said, oh, what's the brand? And they said, Fry's. And Bridie said, oh, wow, that's right. Fry's is out of, I think it's out of South Africa. And, and, and the manager turned to the chef and he goes, yeah, but we don't have all that in the freezer now, do we? And he goes, the chef goes, yeah, we do. He named like all the Fry's vegan meats. And they had them all in the freezer. So I was actually really excited. They had a quinoa corn burger that I was really excited about. But they also had these chicken fillets and these the ground beef and all this stuff in their freezer. So who knew? You wouldn't know unless we asked. Okay, it's gotten really dark. I'm gonna turn the light up and I'm gonna answer a couple more questions and then I'll let you go. But let me let me turn the lights up. <laughs> Cause it's pretty dark in here. We have black cats getting to see them. Maybe this will help, hopefully. Hopefully that will help. Hi Charlie. They're, like, they're now like, isn't it time for dinner? Is that a little better? That's a little better. Okay. So anyway, you never know. This was in Zimbabwe in this restaurant in Victoria Falls in a really touristy area. And we had the best vegan meal. I don't even think I put that video out on Instagram and Facebook yet. I will. Yes, Karen, I'm thinking about in July. Send me an email to support at joyfulvegan.com if you think it's something we can do. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, Riza says, Diam, Diam, Dam, London, would love you. Big vegan scene and awareness growing there. What's Dam, London? I don't know what that is. What is that? Um, can you please, I'm, I'm like not understanding anything you say today, Riza. <laughs> um, hi, sweetie. Christine says, can you please come to Denmark? I know, I know. Melanie Joy also works for a nonprofit organization that raises money for her to be able to travel around the, the world. Um, I don't have that same scenario. So uh, she gets to travel a lot more than I'm able to. But um, Denmark is on my list, so don't fret. We'll make it there one of these days, one way or the, the other. Uh, found a great YouTube channel featuring vegan food preparation, lives healthy life. So many creative and colorful ways to prepare food. Helps me be, helps me be vegan. Helps me be, helps helps keep me vegan. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Uh, when I talk to people, often help them with baby steps. What do you mean, Isaac? What are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying? Was that a complete sentence there? I didn't catch it. Nellie says, I wish people apologized to me at Thanksgiving, Christmas, and our trip to Disney. It's true, right? It's really interesting. It's everybody has different experiences. They really do. Um, Rice says, I remember your almond milk explosion in the blender. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. That was a nightmare. That was because I double batched. I double batched my almond milk and it went, went all over the kitchen. It was a nightmare. Uh, can you please, oh wait, so Christina, I already saw that. She's repeating that. She really mean it. Um, Maynard says, I eat a lot of raw vegan food, so prep and no cooking. Sure, sure. Yeah. So that does require more prep. But that's easy to do, and I mean, my gosh, 20 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, just, you can do so much vegetable prep. Um, adults have band rehearsal, band practices for kids. Yeah, sorry, you're right. I said band practice. Yeah, we call it practice. No, I guess we call it rehearsal. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay. That does sound uh, a little more juvenile. Hi, everyone, says Yaya. Yeah, yeah, can't stay. It's too late. I need to go to bed. Um, back to normal hours. Try at least. Hello, Yaya. Yeah, yeah. Good night. And visit, I like, I can't read what that is. Something lemongrass.com. Actually, a plant-based chef in Hawaii has great ideas. Maybe you can figure that out. New Jersey is where it's at, Valerie. Liz says, I love meal planning on Sunday for the whole week. I have four kids, so I have very little brain power left. Um, I think it's great whether you have four kids or not. I think it's brilliant. Absolutely doing using Sundays for making a bunch of meals for the week is absolutely brilliant. Um, Karen says, talking of animals being exploited for leisure, do you feel like those awful horse and carriages in New York City and New Orleans, et cetera, will be obsolete soon? Yeah, I do, Karen. I really do. I think, you know, I think some of these industries really hold on more tightly especially when they feel threatened. People are silly little beings, and we tend to hold on to things even more tightly when we feel they're being taken away. And I think that's the case with the horse and carriages. I do. And I do think there is going to come a time when they are obsolete. And that doesn't just mean we have wishful thinking. It means we have to act. And there are plenty of people acting on behalf of the horse, the horses and carriages in New York City. And, um, and we have to keep, keep at it. 
and I do believe it will shift. I think public education is really important too. I don't think a lot of people realize it. It seems like such a romantic uh, endeavor. Oh goodness, hold on, Michiko's throwing up. <laughs> Michi, oh goodness. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Your little vomit, little hairball. Okay, everything's fine. Is there more? Oh my goodness, just never, it's always, never a dull moment here. So um, yes, and I think public education is really important as well. Hello, Kirsten, good to see you as well. Am I, can you hear me now? So Riza is, I see what you're talking about, like Oreos and some tortilla chips contain palm oil and there's so much illegal deforestation going on in rainforests in Indonesia where they literally burn it to the ground. Yep, many animals like orangutans, tigers, and sun bears die or get to places because it's really sad. Yeah, Riza, you know, I, I really do think the context of that conversation can be, you know, I love that Oreos are vegan and hey, did you know they were vegan? Isn't that great? You know, isn't that great? Oh, wow, Oreos are vegan. Yeah, but you know what? One of the things that happened when I became vegan is that you start to make connections with all these other issues that we care about because we're compassionate people. And one of the reasons I stopped eating Oreos, even though they're delicious and they're vegan, is because I really have taken a stance on palm oil and, you know, there are vegan co companies who don't use palm oil, and there. Are, I wonder if the Newman's own, like I wonder if being able to provide an alternative, because that's always really helpful for sure, right? So there's probably tortilla chips that don't use palm oil. There's probably Oreos or Oreo-like cookies that don't use palm oil. And knowing what they are, I think would be really helpful. But I don't think you have to, I don't think it has to be black and white. I don't think you're losing out on promoting veganism by also saying, you know, this is about being mindful in, in all these ways. And again, not doing it in a preachy way, but talking about it from your own perspective. Because I have to say that I have taken a stance. And I, there's, like, there's very, I'm very aware of the products I buy that have palm oil. I think the one that I do buy is Earth Balance. And I know, I know the source. <laughs> I know the source of Earth Balance more than I know the source of any other um, product that I buy. But if I see palm oil in just like a typical um, product, I won't buy it. Um, so I don't think it has to be black and white. I think you can still have that conversation and, um, and do your best because that's what we're all doing. We're just trying to do our best. But it's, that's a tough one because it's, it's, it's really these big, massive companies that are contributing to deforestation in places like Borneo and, uh, and Indonesia. And uh, yeah. And I think people are really open to hearing about it. Carla says, I am full of hope, but I think things are going to get a lot worse for the animals before they get better. Well, kind of hard to imagine things getting worse. I think they're only going to get better. I think they're only going to get better, Carla. And as I said, you know, this isn't about wishful thinking negatively or positively. It's about acting. It's about writing the future. It's about writing the story. We, we have the power to write the story. There's a wonderful book out there, and I heard about it on, on the media. It's a podcast I recommend. It's an NPR show. It's an NPR um, podcast, but it's an NPR uh, show. It's called On the Media, and I, I really like it a lot. I am a fan of Bob Garfield, which I know not everybody is, but Bob Garfield and Brooke Gladstone are the hosts of On the Media, and I love Bob Garfield because he was also the co-host of Lexicon Valley, which is a show about language, but um, he's not doing that show anymore. Neither is um, Mike Volo. Someone else is. I don't like, I don't like as much. Um, but Bob Garfield is in a bit of a state of despair because of the election. And he had on a guest who wrote a book called Hope in the Darkness. And he had her on, and I'll tell you, it was just the thing that I needed because I am a very hopeful person and I'm a very action-oriented person, but I have felt my share of despair since, you know, kind of watching the ugliness that is in front of us right now. And it really was so lovely because what I got out of it was, so the, the title of the book, Hope in the Darkness, 
the darkness she's referring to, and she wrote this after the Iraq war, when people were feeling all of this despair and despondency during the Bush administration, the second Bush administration. And uh, she wrote it then, but it's relevant now. And the darkness that's referred to in the title isn't darkness in terms of lack of light. It's darkness in terms of ambiguity, in terms of inscrutability, in terms of not knowing what the future holds. And what I love about that and what she conveyed was that in that inscrutability is the possibility of what we can create. And I love that so much because if we just look at all of what's wrong in this world and just get filled with despair, of course, it usually means that we're inert and we're not doing anything and that's not going to help anybody. But it's also not realistic because we don't know what the future holds. And uncertainty doesn't mean it's going to be all bad. Uncertainty means there's an opening for creating what the possibilities are. Does that make sense? So shift the way you even think about the darkness and look at the darkness as you just can't see what it holds. But that doesn't mean that what it holds is all bad. Does that make sense? So I would recommend the book. Uh, I'd recommend listening to that segment on On the Media. It was actually, I think, this past week's episode and it was just the very tail end I would listen to the whole thing but the tail end when she was talking to um, Bob Garfield was really really good so I don't know if that helps but that's one of the reasons that I have hope um that's okay Riza I just didn't know what you were talking about and Isaac was saying that some people can't jump into vegan lifestyle overnight I try to give them one meat give up meat for one month well that's why I did the 30 day vegan challenge Isaac to be able to give people like just do 30 days because I know you're going to experience the joys and benefits within that 30-day period and give yourself a chance to create some new habits. Hashtag language does matter, Riza. Making vegan mashed cauliflower right now, says Maynard. I'm very jealous. I'd like some of that, please. Um, uh, is it Lily Koi? Is passion fruit in Hawaii. Oh, sorry, Robert. I'm not familiar with it. Can't wait to hear the podcast about your trip. I know, Kirsten, that's going to be a while trying to get more episodes out of Animology, which I know you're subscribed to, and I hope all of you are subscribed to Animology Podcast. I'm not going to stop saying it. And I need you to go over and write a review and put a little rating, a little five-star rating. Um, it's not in the new and noteworthy section of iTunes, and it's been out for now, what, almost two months? And that's what we need. So I need you to go download, subscribe, write a review, put a rating. It'll take you all of three minutes to do all of that for me, please. Pretty please. Um, Risa says, New York City Mayor de Blasio tried to abolish horse carriage rides, but hasn't been successful. I know. He's getting a lot of pushback. He sure is. Cauliflower is the best, Isaac. I agree. Uh, Newman's own isn't always vegan. True, but isn't there, I, I think their cookies are, but I don't know if they have palm oil. I don't know if they have palm oil, but yeah, worth worth checking out. Maynard says, definitely I started veganism because of health, and now I um, know and I'm passionate about the planet. I love it. I don't know what you're thanking me for, Riza, but you're welcome. Riza says, do you think the new... Oh, I think now I know what you're thanking me for because of the, my perspective. Um, do you think the new law to introduce security cameras only viewable by officials and inspectors, I think, in slaughterhouses in France is a good thing? Yes, I do. I do. I think accountability in every way is a good thing. Yes. Yes, and it's such a juxtaposition in light of all the ag-gag rules that are happening here in the United States, isn't it? I mean, it's just such a juxtaposition. I think <laughs> when we were gone, we also heard about a law that passed in France that, is, that makes it illegal to e email your employees after 5 p.m. you got to love France. you just got to love that about them. It's not a lot I love about France. <laughs> I'm kidding. I like France. Okay, go ahead. Um, but you got to love that and that and the cameras. Yes. Um, thank you, April. And Betsy says, I am hopeful for the gorillas as I've been to Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo. And because of the popularity of the tourists, seeing the gorillas in Rwanda, other countries want to follow. Rwanda is sub subsidizing the park in the Congo for the gorillas. Hopefully tourists will go as we, I think there's more, but I agree with you, Betsy. It is so encouraging to see the work that Rwanda has done on behalf of the gorillas. I'll tell you, I, 
I am very inspired by Rwanda. I know that it is, um, here is an example. I mean, this is such a perfect example. So much good comes from darkness. So much light comes from darkness. So many good things come from the worst atrocities, whether they're human created or natural disasters. So much light comes from it. And Rwanda is one of those examples. It experienced the most horrific, horrific thing that any people could ever possibly experience. And that was the genocide in 1994. And they have come out of it and are still coming out of it with so much resilience. And it's so difficult because they're still living the effects of the genocide today. It's, it's still in their everyday lives, in the loss, in the absences of the people they loved. And seeing what they have been doing is so incredible. And one of the things that I really love about uh, one of their policies for healing and for creating unity in Rwanda is how many how community oriented they are. And so one of the things I did yesterday was reach out to one of my neighbors, looking at her house right now, and asked if she would like to conspire with me to at least invite other neighbors to my house and ask if they wanted, you know, just kind of put our heads together about ways that we as a community can come together and, and be more sustainable. Maybe it's us being able to buy things in bulk so that we don't have to buy as much packaging if we're all going to buy the same thing. Maybe it's everybody being willing to have a vegan meal shared, you know, as an exchange once a week, twice a week, maybe more, have some kind of collective vegan meal. Maybe it's everybody planting fruit trees so that everybody can, can enjoy the fruits, the fruits of our labors. No pun intended. Okay. Pun, pun intended. Um, so, but the idea is to just put our heads together because there's a lot of things that we can, we can do, uh, as a community. And that was one of the things that I came away with from being in Rwanda. I am so inspired by them. And so of course the work they're doing around the mountain gorillas that was started by Diane Fossey. Um, and her birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, Diane Fossey, uh, is incredibly inspiring. So, so get out there and do what inspires you and moves you and do it with other people and connect with other people and feel the hope. And MJ says, I need that hope in the darkness so much. I'm happy this topic came up. I feel like a roller coaster of emotions. I understand. Hope, despair, hope, despair, but I am trying to combat despair by staying involved and calling my representatives. Wonderful. And, you know, and MJ, one of the things I think you'll get from the interview with, um, I think her name's Robin and, and Bob, is that it's, 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 it's really holding both of those. It's not denying that things are bad and it's not, believing that things are going to be good just because you want to believe them. Do you understand? So it's not about just, um, denying that things are bad. Things are things, it, it, th you know, things are, there's some darkness, <laughs> uh, and there's work to be done, but we can face it and we can look at it and also feel hope. In fact, I swear I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'll read you a little excerpt and then I'm going to go because my cats are hungry, I'm hungry, and I'm going to meet a friend. And I just want, I'll read this to you. I only just read this little bit just uh, earlier. So let me, let me read this to you. So it's talking about memory. It's talking about remembering. Memory produces hope in the same way that amnesia produces despair. The theologian Walter Brueggemann noted, it's an extraordinary statement, one that reminds us that though hope is about the future, grounds for hope lie in the records and recollections of the past. And I wrote this in a blog post, actually, not, not because I read this, just because I thought of it myself. Um, I wrote that one of the things that gives me hope is the past. So go check out that blog post. It's on my website. And this is what she's talking about here. We can tell of a past that was nothing but defeats and cruelties and injustices, 
or of a past that was some lovely golden age now irretrievably lost, or we can tell a more complicated and accurate story, one that has room for the best and the worst, for atrocities and liberations, for grief and jubilation, a memory commensurate to the complexity of the past and the whole cast of participants, a memory that includes our power, produces that forward-directed energy called hope. So we can hold all of this and we can look it right in the face. We can look cruelty and violence and injustice and inequality in the face. And in the face of it, find the hope because we'll find the possibilities and we'll find and recognize the solutions. And in that, feel empowered to act. But holding all of that is what we need to do. That doesn't mean that you don't have to, you know, you'll have a roller coaster of emotions. It doesn't mean you won't feel sad. It doesn't mean you won't cry. Feel all of that, but don't get bogged down in it because it's not the truth. It's not the whole truth. It's not the whole truth. The whole truth is complicated and complex and all of these things at the same time. And we can hold all of those things at the same time. Um, I love Immanuel Kant's quote on animals and man. Which one is that, Isaac? Judy says, I was feeling down. This really inspired me. I'm so glad. Rises has come to Singapore sometime. PETA named us Asia's second most vegan friendly city. And we recently hosted Will Tuttle. That's amazing. That's awesome. Well, I'm not going to make any promises, but we are looking to stop possibly in Singapore on the way to Thailand in October, but I'm not making any promises because we might stop in Japan instead. Isaac says, some of my friends allow me to come to their home on Mondays to cook vegan meals. I love that, Isaac. That's awesome. I love that. That's beautiful. And Maynard says, come to Missouri someday. I'll share some mashed cauliflower. Sounds good. I love it. I love it. Okay. So does that help? You're welcome. And check it out. It's my little Kindle. My little Kindle. Uh, check out Hope in the Darkness. Hope in the Darkness, the full title is Hope in the Darkness, Untold History's Wild Possibilities. Possibilities. Possibilities in the darkness. We can write the story. We can write the future. So go write the future. I'm going to go write the future uh, by having a, a, some scotch <laughs> with my friend. <laughs> to be frank, I'm going to be frank. I haven't had scotch in months because we've been gone and I haven't had any since I've been home. So I'm going to go have some of my favorite scotch in my favorite bar with one of my favorite friends. And uh, I'm very excited. And thanks, April. I didn't realize that it happened on Tuesday. So maybe Tuesdays becomes our, our, our inspiration uh, night. I don't think I realized that was happening, but I guess it makes sense because it's the night that David doesn't come home. So have a wonderful, wonderful Tuesday night. He who is cruel to animals become becomes hard also in his dealings with men. We can judge the heart of man by his treatment of animals. Absolutely. Amen to that, Isaac. Thank you so much for joining me, everybody, and staying for this whole time. It's been, I think, about an hour, gosh, um, or a little less than that. But have a wonderful night. Scotch, yay. Yay. Um, <laughs> yay, everyone. Yay, compassion. I want to see your reviews on animology. I'm going to hold you to it. I'm not asking for anything other than that. Thanks, Kyle. You're welcome. Please, Animology, go download it on iTunes. Go subscribe to it. Even if you don't listen on iTunes and you listen somewhere else, iTunes is where we need to kind of get a huge, a huge uh, amount of downloads and subscriptions and reviews. So please go do that. I'm going to go look right now. I'm going to go look. So I'm going to hold you to it. For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thanks for watching, everybody.